Welcome to Civic Buzz, a program of the League of Women Voters Minneapolis. I'm Ellen Van Iwarden, Program Director for the League, and I'll be moderating our presentation tonight. The League is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation at all levels of government. Work to increase understanding of major policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy, or as we like to say, educate, advocate, empower, repeat. I'm thrilled to be helping the League with this critical work and encourage you, if you're not already a member, to join us. You can find out more at lwvminneapolis.org. Tonight, I'm honored to present Jolene Jones of the Native American Community Development Institute, NACTI, in Minneapolis. Jolene's heritage includes membership in the Ojibwe, White Earth, and Lac Court Oriel tribes. Jolene grew up in South Minneapolis and has been working on the Make Voting a Tradition program for NACD for six years. After hearing her speak, our Voting Services Committee recommended her as someone all League members should hear. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Jolene will be happy to take questions throughout her presentation. So if you raise your hand, I'll call on you. And Jolene, please take it away. So, Buju Mishko Banishi and Dishnikaz Mungdu Dame. So I am Jolene Jones. I'm the Native Table Coordinator for Make Voting a Tradition. I live in Little Earth in Minneapolis, which is Dakota land, and I am an Anishinaabe. So I'm going to take it away. First of all, the history of make voting a tradition. NACTI had been doing voting work within the Native community for many years. And in 2014, they did a survey of the Native American community. And the community said to them, if voting is so important, why do you only come when it's voting time? Why don't you come before? Why don't you come year round so we can talk about issues and, and get our people to vote? So NACTI did and they created Make Voting a Tradition in 2014. So in the last two years, we've expanded to the rural areas, to our reservations also. And I'm just gonna keep yakking until you guys stop me. Um, so one of the things we noticed were the barriers that historically in our community was they never felt like they had the right to vote because it wasn't until 1962 that all natives could vote. Oklahoma was the last one to fight that we didn't have voting rights and we won in 62. We still face barriers today in South Dakota, Arizona and other areas. But we're gonna talk about Minnesota cause we're the best. <clears throat> so the barriers we currently face right now to voting is for our reservations is the fact that they're a rural area. And we vote in November when it snows. So a lot of them can't get out to vote. A lot of them like to vote in person, not by absentee ballot. They also have issues getting absentee ballots. We haven't figured that out yet, but we will figure out why they have issues with them. The good thing that Minnesota started now is you can track your absentee ballot. So that helps us a lot. But like me and Ellen were talking about, like if it snows, in our rural areas, they can't get their streets plowed, their driveways plowed out to go vote. So that's that's an issue. I don't know if we would ever change it because it's nationwide. Another barrier is for our homeless. And as you guys know, most of the most of the homeless are BIPOC community members. And it's very difficult to register them to vote. And when we do get them registered, like we did in 2020, they come out and they vote very good, but they, like other, like most people, they're constantly moving and being moved. So like last year in 2021, when we went to get our native homeless to vote, we took them to the polls where they were registered at and they were told they couldn't vote there because they had moved from Franklin and Cedar to 27th and Bloomington and them are just blocks apart. And our homeless were like, well, I ain't going anywhere else. I'm done. You know, I walked here. So we face that barrier too. And that also comes to a barrier for the, for the indigenous community in general, is we're very mobile people. We move around a lot. Like 
you'll register somebody and they'll be in Minneapolis one year, the following year they're living in St. Paul, the following year they're back on their reservation. We are a very mobile people. So we, so one of the things you guys always need to ask is when somebody tells you they're registered and they're native, say you ain't moved in the last year, have you? Because we move a lot. It's not because we have to, it's just something I think that's in our blood. We've always moved around a lot. Um, if I'm talking too fast, just let me know. Um, one of the issues that's currently, we current, we really try, make voting a tradition tries to make sure that our people know their voice matters. Like we talk about the pipeline to try to get them to vote. We talk about ICWA. ICWA is the Indian Child Welfare Act, and that's currently going before the Supreme Court. It'll probably be up in it by next year at the latest. I'm not sure of the date for the Supreme Court, you guys. I apologize. But if you bring up issues and tell them, you know, your voice matters, your vote matters. We don't tell them who to vote for. We just, when they want to talk to issues, we tell them, you know, you got to vote. If you vote, your voice is heard. That's how your voice is heard. And that's how you create your power for yourself. One of the things that MVAT uses when our voters tell us my vote don't matter is we use Hutch for an example. Hutch won by that small degree that was the native vote. And I honestly believe that somebody down by electric fetus hung up a sign on that great big billboard. It was on a sheet and it said, remember Standing Rock because Stanick sent our sheriffs there and they sprayed indigenous people who were protesting. And then Hutch won by that narrow margin that was the indigenous vote. Um, do you guys have any questions so far? Could you talk about the child issue, the child issue that you mentioned? You talked so quickly. I don't know what that's about. Okay. So Thank the you. Indian Child Welfare Act is what it basically is, is indigenous children are, are not taken from their communities and placed in other communities. So the first, the first rule of ICWA is to place them with family or with an indigenous home because of our culture and how we've been stripped of it so bad. And that's been challenged a few times in the last few years and it's being challenged again, but this time it made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And basically what ICWA does is keep Indian children in Indian homes. Okay, thank you. Yep. So. Pauline, um you mentioned that some other states, there are barriers to Native Americans voting, like South Dakota and Arizona. What's happening there? The biggest thing that's happening with, with, with a lot of our people is the fact that they live in rural areas and on reservations, and they, they have P.O. boxes, and you cannot vote with a P.O. box. you got to have an exact address. And that makes it difficult because... It's not only difficult for voting, you guys, it's very difficult for the census. That's why we are massively undercounted in the census too, is that P.O. box is not, they don't consider it an address. And we're lucky we live in the state of Minnesota because they take tribal IDs to vote in person. And in South Dakota, Arizona, they don't take them. And that is a big issue is them P.O. boxes. And trying to get, your state to give you an address is hard. You know, we're lucky in Minnesota when that issue first started coming up in Minnesota, most of our reservations have addresses here in Minnesota because Minnesota tried to make sure of that when they did in the rural areas and that when that question first started coming up, Minnesota was on it. I felt, I don't think Minnesota's perfect with voting stuff like I talked about our homeless. I taught same day voting is good, but it's also very hard. Um, felony voters, trying to educate them when they can vote, getting having our people have access who are sitting currently in jail, have been charged, but have not been prosecuted, trying to get them to vote. It's very hard to get into the jails. And it's a lot of the BIPOC community members who are in them jails that need to vote. You know, yep, go ahead, Kate. I can't hear you, you're muted. 
need to um, unmute. <laughs> How about Native American youth? Do they uh, register and, and, and vote pretty regularly? We are we are working on that. And they actually last year, it was pretty awesome, you guys. With, with COVID and last year and all of that, I was very impressed to notice that our youth were coming. They were like, so what we ran into is a lot of our youth saying, I'm going to vote and then I, I got to go get my grandma. So it was pretty cool because they were like, and we watched them bring their grandparents back to vote, you know, and it was like, wow, this is awesome. That was a little change of the tide there, but we worked very hard with some of our surrounding high schools to, to register them to vote and to tell them their voting matters. And a lot of our schools are, the charter schools are teaching voting and civic engagement and all of that. And you can see the progress we've made by getting our people to vote is by how many Native Americans are running for office now. You know, we got a couple for the school board. We got a senator, is it a senator that's running up north? I, I think that's what he is, a senator. And then we got, you know, our Lieutenant Governor. You know, we're just, that just shows that we're making strides, but we still have a long ways to go. Do, does the community believe in early voting? If that was, since it's, legal in Minnesota and you did early voting, could we arrange some sort of transportation system for those who have moved, for example? You know, I don't, so the early voting, I, I, I love it. And I, we are, we are hitting it hard this year. So I'm happy you brought that up. We're going to have an early voting event on the 24th, 5th, and 6th, and we sure would like you guys to help if you want to, but we're going to be doing it at OIC by where our light rail is, so we're going to be, we'll have like pumpkin bars, we'll have hot cocoa, coffee, you know, we'll have a lot of stuff out, but early voting has not been a big hit with our community, and we have tried, and we're going to try keep trying, because I like early voting, especially for our elders, because I don't want them out there falling down in the winter time. But we're working on that, but it's not something that they do. And in the rural areas are the ones that really need the rides. You know, up in Natawash and White Earth, um, one of their communities right outside of Natawash, it's still part of Natawash. People say it different, Natawash or Natawash. But they have to drive almost 50 miles to vote. You know, and that's why I say us voting in the wintertime, I, I think they... They don't want the winter states to vote. No, I'm joking. I have, that's a joke. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, we got so many things going on. The pipeline, and we got the pipeline. We got the fact that a lot of our rural areas and our reservations, they do have a system to plow out. But if it snows that day or the day before, it's very hard. They're not going to get plowed out. Not everybody is. That's why we're trying to encourage early voting. They don't really care for absentee ballots. So we're hoping early voting will help us a lot more. And we're encouraging our youth to help us. And it's great that the schools are doing so much, the charter schools around us. And it, I think the more we involve our youth, the better off we are. And we do make, so like, I don't know if any of you know, we just did a, a um, get out and vote event with, with OIC and we did ballots. And we made some beautiful indigenous ballots, but they were like like the regular ballots. We just had like indigenous characters on them for them to vote for. And we we not only had a regular voter stand, we had one for our kids. So we really were trying to make it voting a tradition because I think if you involve the kids, we're encouraging them to vote and we're showing them how to do it. So, because it's actually scary to go in there by yourself the first time or to go in there and not know what you're doing. And so we're trying to make it a little easier. And the city of Minneapolis was nice enough to give us the, the boost that they use so that it felt the same way. Only thing we shrunk one down for the kids and that was cute too, to watch them vote. But, you know, we're just striving when our community tells us, you know, this is what we need. This is what we we're having issues with voting. 
you know, like I had an elder who was 82 years old who had never voted. And when he was born, he couldn't vote. You know, he, he we weren't even citizens of this country till 1924, June 2nd, by the way. And did I lose you guys? No. Oops, okay. Sorry. I, I, and, I don't know why, but I have to. I'm launching the meeting again. I'm not sure why. All of a sudden it went to. Um, okay. Um, when I see you have your hand up. There. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm going to click on um, my Zoom down here and see if we can get it back. Not sure how that happened. Um, let's see. It says we're viewing your screen, Kathleen. Can you change that back? I, I'm hitting launch meeting and then I get uh, join a meeting or sign in. Uh, should I just hit join a meeting? Um, I would. Can you, yeah. Can you, I can see people on I my can, screen except is blocked because you're, you're sharing. Did you, did you log in on the league site? Me, are you talking? Can you just. Can you just stop sharing your screen? I think we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, go up to the top and yes, up to the top of the screen and stop sharing. I don't think I'm sharing. There you go. There you go. There you go. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Thanks so much, Diane. And I seen Gwen's hand was up. Where'd she go? Did I lose her? Nope, she's here. Okay. Um, I've got a question because I know there are a number of precincts in the state. Uh, like the end of the Gunflint Trail, they always vote for, by mail. I mean, that's it. They vote by mail, end of discussion. And if you've got people that are 50 miles from a polling place, is there a possibility that, that there could be a gathering that they could come all come together and, and vote an absentee ballot so that maybe it wouldn't be a foreign experience, but my God, they can't, <laughs> you can't expect somebody to drive 50 miles to the polls expects, especially in November. So one of our one of our partners who's honored the earth and they're auto white earth, they're trying to deal with that. And they were hoping to either provide a bus or do an absentee request jointly, you know, like have a meeting space where everybody fills out the ballot together. You know, I mean, the, not the ballot, the uh, request and they show them, you know, what they need to do in that. So I can update you when I know more about that, Gwen. I believe that event's coming up very soon. And that's Honor the Earth out of White Earth who's doing that. that that's a good group. And I don't, I don't know how these precincts end up simply voting by mail, but they're just too far from Grand Marais, which is where they would have to go to vote. Uh, and there might, and I know there are others. I just am not familiar with the others. But if they could get some more of those precincts, they don't get a, a an absentee ballot request form, which is a pain to fill out. They simply get a ballot and they mail it in. Yeah, and see, and that's smart. But it's not just us in Minnesota and rural areas who's facing that. That's all the reservations throughout the United States that they're exactly it's very difficult for them to vote. And a lot of them feel like Minnesota has track your ballots. A lot of states don't. So they feel like they're mailing it in and it's not being counted. So they want to go in in person and then it's a struggle. And then when the day comes, stuff goes wrong, yeah. you know? And like I said, we're very lucky. Minnesota has certain things that helps us to tell people, you know, when they don't want to vote absentee, like we had a lady and we showed them how to track their ballots. So we do stuff like that with our community. But we just started it in the last year. <laughs> right. Did you have a question, Katie? Well, uh, I just wanted to get the dates for this uh, early voting event that Jolene mentioned. So, so that early voting event is going to be the 24th of October, 25th of October, and 26th. We're going to, then we'll be, that will be from 11 to 2. 
So we're trying to catch people on their lunch hours and high traffic time up by the light rail. And we'll actually be at OIC's parking lot because OIC, where we did our get out and boat event, actually borders right there with the with the uh, light rail. So hopefully people can get on, grab a coffee, grab a pumpkin bar, get on the light rail, go downtown and boat at the government center and come back and yay for them. We'll be excited. Um, Great idea. Uh, well, they the, have to the government. Go ahead. Center. I'm how sorry, close, I can't hear you. How close is that? Is um, where the light rail is to the government center? Like you, it's right there. Oh, it's right there. Okay. It's okay. right there. You can get off right at the government center. Oh, good. Okay. So on the 17th and 18th, because them are our last two two days to register voters. We will, we will be doing online them two days and them two days we're going to hit our homeless. So we're waiting and that is, we decided this year to try a little something different because they're being pushed around so much. I mean, if they're in one spot, they're getting moved and they're moving from the next spot. So we're going to wait till the last two days of voter registration to register the majority of our homeless. We're going we're gonna to hit them and we're going to hopefully hit them big and get them registered. We also got, we've been registering our homeless who are no longer homeless. So we've been, we've been registering the ones that have found housing. We've, we've had phone numbers for them. So we've tracked them down to re-register them. Um, you know, I just think that it's so hard to get people to vote when they felt, when they feel like they've never been been connected with the government. I don't know if that's the way to say it. When they feel disenfranchised and like the government's going to track me, it's very hard to get them to vote. Yes, and I'm just wondering what kind of help you're interested in for the, that 24th, 25th, and 26th. Any help. So we'll be doing so we'll just be talking about early voting, educating. I got to say, you guys, and I've talked with Noah, who is one of our national partners, NUNICEF, who's one of our national partners. I've talked with other voting, voting places. We've tried to do it ourselves. I got to give you a hand for that book you published because that is awesome. And I need to order more of them because we have gone through the ones you gave us like crazy because you have everything in it. And I just want to say yay to you guys, because you guys hit the nail on the head with that, especially for our community, because that's what they've been asking for. And we've been trying to create one and you guys just passed us right up and did it. So do you want people to show up at your um, Yeah, at I a want location? people to show up. So it's just, so, I just want to where would, people, go ahead. Where would that be? Can you give us an address? Oh my God, what is that address? You know what, I'll email it. I don't know that address. To me, I always just say Cedar and Fra Cedar Avenue and Franklin. But it's uh, at the American Indian OIC. Amer American Indian Opportunities Industrial Center. Opportunities and industrial. Okay, so you just want kind of support and encouragement. Yeah, we're not registering anybody. Our registration right now, like I said, we're registered. We we're going to our high traffic areas in our community, and we're doing it like we did at our Four Sisters Farmers Market today. I think we did seventeen registrations the other day at the bank. We caught like six of our people. So you know, we're just going out and trying to register them. And then the last two days will be all about our homeless. Ellen. Thank you. Uh, Jolene, you mentioned help from the city of Minneapolis, the um, uh, sample voting booth, so people could see what the experience was like. Have other communities, or, or more specifically, towns where voting locations are been helpful or ha have you tried to work with communities? Uh, uh, Gwen mentioned Grand Marais, for example, uh, where some of the white earth people apparently would vote. I, I don't know all those places around the state. 
but is there a possibility of working with them and explaining some of the difficulties for rural voters uh, to get your community to feel a little more familiar with where they're going to have to go to vote if they do it in person? So we have partners up north that are working on that. And I went up and I testified before the Bermidji, no, not I testified during the census and that. So we do go up there. We have the Northwest CDC in Bermidji that's helping. Leech Lake tends, tends to be okay, except when you start getting out into the rural areas, but they've been very um, assertive in making sure their people can vote. There's still issues, but not as many. Um, I believe Honor the Earth is really working hard to make sure that all of White Earth can vote and we're not, they're not even near Grand Marais. Grand Marais would be near Grand Portage. And I, and I believe a lot of the people from Grand Portage vote, vote by absentee ballot because they're way up there in Northern Minnesota. So you guys, some of the, some of the difficulties, like I said, when you're asking people if, if they're registered and they'll tell you they're registered, you just got to say to them, have you moved in the last year? I think that's a question you guys need to ask, not just the BIPOC community members, but all community members. Have you moved in the last year? So you become in the habit of it. Um, another good thing with working with, with indigenous people, you can always, always say, you know, do you know what make voting a tradition is, you know? They're on the cultural corridor or on Franklin Avenue. We can always help help you guys with any voting. I have, so it's not just us because I have Spanish speaking canvassers too, because I live in the East Phillips neighborhood, you guys, which is the most diverse neighborhood in the state of Minnesota. You know, there's gotta be over 50 languages spoken in this neighborhood. And, it, and there is a lot of the Hispanic population and the Somalian population here. So, you know, all of our communities have to come together to get our people to vote. You know, you said that the young people really came out during COVID to vote. Do you know what issues motivated them or why they were so active or inspired to go and vote? I think, oh, making sure my voice is on. I think a lot of it had to do with their schools and their schools doing more civic engagement. And with the fact that the kids were kind of stuck on the computers and that they got to see a lot more. Yeah. Because yeah. Okay. you pay better attention when you ain't got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that also MVAT engaging, we've been engaging a lot of teachers yeah. that are indigenous that work at South High and work at Center School, work at Tatanka Academy, all of them places. We've been engaging them. So I'm hoping we're helping, we're making a difference. And we also, and that also, so we do a data bank. We just started two years ago, but we register our 16 and 17 year olds separately from their family because we want to send them a happy happy birth happy 18th birthday remember to vote card. <laughs> That's fabulous. So we know, we're, we start tracking them, so that might help us too a little bit there. That's amazing. You know, when did, oh have, go ahead. Have you spoken with Steve Simon um, yeah. about the issues and what what is his office doing to uh, facilitate your work? Because your work is obviously pretty intense. Steve's pretty awesome. He's he he listens, and he tries. And right now, like I said, we're just now moving into the rural areas and creating partnerships with the other voting up there. Like we have a couple events going on up there on Indigenous Peoples Day, which is Monday. Uh, we have a big thing going on in Cass Lake, so we'll be up there tabling. We'll be getting our people registered because we partnered with the Northwest Community Development institute up there so we'll be all working together honor the earth is doing something in white earth so it's it's about us all creating partnerships and expanding it into our communities i don't know if i answered your question now well I'm sorry. yeah I, I, I have also heard him speak and i know he's 
really sincere when he says he wants the voting to be um, as inclusive as possible and to have as many Minnesotans as possible voting. But obviously you have uh, some specific challenges with the, with the community being so rural. Yeah, some of it, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Art. All right, Gwen, your hand is up. Oh, okay. I've just been reading an article um, on the spread of lacrosse amongst um, amongst Indian communities and and white communities. And in fact, the article, which is in the Christian Science Monitor, features the Twin Cities. But I was wondering if there's any ceremonial aspect you could add to people getting together and voting. I mean, it it is such an important part of their lives. Honor the Earth has been very active in political mm -hmm. activities. Um, if there is something that from the culture that could be brought into the act of voting, just probably probably doesn't make any sense, but it just is a thought. No, it does because I just, so culturally we're, we're the ones who originally voted. <laughs> we're the ones who've always done everything by vote. Right. Um, exactly. Historically. And that's basically what this government's built on is the Iroquois nation how they operated. So everything's yes. done by vote. This is something that's historical to us. But what's not historical is the trauma we, well, it is historical. The trauma we suffered yeah. has made us, made the majority of our people very paranoid about the government, very scared of the government. So we have, we overcome a lot to vote. Because like I said, I had an 82 year old gentleman who voted for the very first time and he was scared to vote because he couldn't vote when he was young. And there's stuff that happened in his generation that I wouldn't understand, but we got him to vote. We took his pictures too. We were so proud, but I find it's harder to get my elders to vote. If they don't vote, then them families don't vote. So that's sure? our first step as our elders because they're the ones who've been traumatized and they're the ones who need to vote to get their family members to vote. But our kids can do it. And that's why it was so surprising to watch our teens say, I gotta go get my grandma. And they come back with them, you know? But some of them families were families that have voted for a long time too. It's awesome, you guys, when you see somebody vote who's never voted before. It's awesome. It's awesome to see our teens vote. That's one of the reasons why make voting a tradition. One of the things we give out is shirts and we tell our people, just look for a shirt like yours. Wear it on voting day. You won't feel alone. You know, we have the booths and that's to make them try to feel a little more comfortable if they're alone. Um, we tell them they can bring their kids with them when they vote because we have voting stuff for the kids. Um, and we tell them their voice matters. It's your voice, your voice. And Honor the Earth, Gwen, can do a lot more than MVAC can because I believe Honor the Earth also has a C4. And, and we're only a C3. I do not have a C4. So I cannot do some of the stuff Honor the Earth can do. And that is not allowed to do because we are a C3 and not a C4. And I believe Honor the Earth holds both of them. What is C3 and C4? Yeah. The, the league is a, is a C3. The League of Women Voters is a C3. Oh, I yeah, we're, as well. it means you're a nonprofit and you have to remain nonpartisan. A C4 can support candidates, something we cannot do. And they can do other things that we can't do. Go ahead, Ellen. You're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, just backing up a little, uh, you mentioned that um, Native Americans are undercounted in the census um, for the same reasons in some states they have difficulty voting because of this post office box issue. And do you have, I was surprised when I was doing some research for our um, study guide this month at the number I found for Native Americans in Minnesota, which seemed smaller you know, than I expected. Um, do you know how many um, Native Americans there are in Minnesota or what do you estimate? Um, so when we were at, when I just went to a census follow-up meeting 
and they figured that we were by percentage wise, we were at 5.26% undercounted by the numbers we have right now. Mm -hmm. And you could see that and just like, and that has to do with not only our rural areas, urban areas too. And that has to do with, and I don't like to call it historical trauma because it happened in my lifetime. But a lot of it is due to the trauma that's been caused to our people. They don't want to be counted. They don't want the government to know how many kids they have. Not when somebody stole your children, you know, and put them in boarding schools. Not when they've stole them and put them in foster care. You know, you don't want them to know how many kids you got. A lot of them, a lot of them don't. And if they do do it, they don't put all their kids on it. We found that out too. They don't put their younger ones on the census. Mm. So it's just, it's, it has a lot to do with, I know it's crazy, but it's true. You know, if you've ever had your children stolen, you would not put all your children on a census or you would not fill out the census. I lived right here in Little Earth. One of my things was to make sure our community was counted. And this in 2020, it was nuts, you guys, because it was like, oh, it's the last day. No, we extended it this day, this day, and this day. And then they finally said last day. We registered 129 families on that day. We stood outside and registered them to make sure that our community was counted. And I still got a couple of my big families here that never did the census. You know, I got one young girl who, who has six kids and she wasn't done so that's six kids that weren't counted and herself so you know it's and that's the same thing that happens with voting is they get paranoid they're scared and if you've never experienced it you can't explain it you can't explain it you know like me I grew up and I'm sure you guys all remember when they used to put the little DFL thing on your door when I was a kid, I, I'm sure everybody did it, but it'd have all your candidates on it. And when yeah, I sample turned, ballot, huh? Sample ballot. Yeah, sample ballot. And when I turned 18, my mother handed me that and she was like, this, this, and this. And she sent me in the vote. In our community, that doesn't happen in a lot of our families. They don't my send mother was it out very, anymore. I know they don't give them out. My mother was very civic oriented. So not much anyway. I was very lucky that I got bossed in the voting. <laughs> um, what else? Let's see. So we went over history, some of the barriers, the issues not only facing us, but the whole country for indigenous voters. Talked about early voting, absentee ballots. Is there anything else you guys would like to talk about? In your community, are there... Are there people or is there a certain percentage of people who think that the election was stolen or, um, you know, who don't feel that the election is fair or worthwhile because of that? I'm going to say in my community, I live in Little Earth. So I'm going to say no. Okay. I live in Little Earth. So no. Janet? Um. I'm wondering uh, about how daunting like this year's ballot is. It has lots and lots of different offices to vote for. Um, so getting people to the polls, but then I'm worried about when they look at all that stuff and especially all the judges, um, but even all the other offices, um, if, they, if that's a barrier as well. It is, it's, it's us. So, so, so we, we got a little saying right now for our people. It's like the ones who vote. Well, for everybody, we're telling them, don't forget to flip that ballot. Flip it. <laughs> There's people on the back. Flip that ballot. And we'll be out in our community telling our people and reminding them to flip their ballots. One of the things, and I'm going to say it, one of the things is we have two Indigenous women running for the school board. School board's on the back of that ballot. A lot of our community members will be looking for them. When we were out for the primaries and trying to get our community to vote, we were in the park over here and there was two young people who weren't even part of either one of them campaigns who, when we were telling people to vote, they were like, don't forget uh, so-and-so's on the ballot. It's on the backside. And them kids knew and they were young. They weren't even old enough to vote. And they were like out there campaigning for two of the school board members. And they were like, don't forget to flip that ballot. And I was like, wow, I wonder who educated them. Yeah, amazing. 
And I think uh, Sandra, one of my canvassers, asked them, and they went to the Dakota Institute, and that's where they got educated on their ballot. Mm -hmm. Neat. Yep, Katie. Does anyone know um, if the kids vote program is still going in the public schools? Uh, it was um, something that Judy Farmer started, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, but uh, she passed away several years ago and I don't know whether it died with her. She I don't to... have an idea. I'm talking, the yeah. kids are it, 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 it was a very nice program. She would, yeah, I sometimes volunteered over here at the neighborhood school, you, the kids, it, it was set up totally like voting and it was right outside the polling place in our local school. Um, I also went up to Edison once to volunteer. The kids came in and they, they got a ballot and, and uh, but um, it wasn't a ballot that got turned in. It, yeah. um, uh, well, I think actually they did get results for their school anybody else remember? Yeah, I remember that when our kids were small. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the schools do that anymore. Anyway, so it was good education for, for getting. Well, I know that our charter schools offer very good civic education oh, good. for our yeah, high schools. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, Gwen. I hope our high schools are offering very good civic education as well. The best thing that ever happened to high school government teachers was when they lowered the voting age to 18, because I had kids in my classes that could vote. And the ones that couldn't were seriously disappointed. And the ones who could flaunted their I voted little stickers. So I hope that, uh, I hope that the, the teach school teachers um, and all the schools for what, that have high school seniors are spending a lot of time on the election. I bet. Right, I agree. Jolene, this is such important work that you're doing. How, yes. how does NACTI fund it? Through grants. They get funding through grants, through partnerships. Um, they apply for grants. This year we've done pretty okay because we're part of Illuminative and that's been a good grant. And we also got the energy grant. So we were excited about that. And that's a three-year grant. Mm -hmm. I'm, I apologize, you guys, I'm at home. So I got my puppies are crying right now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, thanks. What kind of puppies do you have? I have two. Um, uh, Chihuahua, a full-blooded Chihuahua, and then I have a Chihuahua who's half um, miniature Doverman Pincher. Ooh. So they're two little cute guys. <laughs> cute, very cute. Well, does anyone have more questions? Is there anything else that Jolene would like us to know? Mm. Um, Jolene, um, I'm thinking. Are, yeah, go ahead. Are, are members of, of your community familiar with um, showing up at the precinct caucuses that happen uh, every couple of years in February, you pick your party. Um, and that's kind of how a lot of people get hooked into whatever's happening in their local Senate district and can get involved in candidate selection. And so you heard about our Senate district and we got kicked out of Harding High, right? You 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 know that right oh. now our what? district is not allowed anywhere. So there was issues. And yes, we held a caucus here at Little Earth in, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. in 2020. And it was the first one we held. And it was the biggest one held in Minneapolis. Our wow. general poll, we had over 200 people in our itty bitty gym. Yeah. And we picked our reps and that and all of that. And, and then I'll help busted loose at 62B. Are we 62B or A? 62. You're, so your Senate district would be 62. And then you, you've got two house districts, A and yeah, B. 62 didn't go good. So well, we, we got kicked out of this high school <laughs> and there was some, some pushing and shoving, some hair pulling and 
My people well, didn't want to be a part of that. <laughs> so I'm in 63 and we had, we struggled too. We couldn't get, uh, the schools weren't uh, holding caucuses because of COVID-19 uh, last year. So we had to do online. Well, I don't know about that, but that might be something we'd be interested in again, the community itself. But our experience was not that, it was awesome, but it was the follow-up that wasn't awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But hopefully we'll keep moving forward. We still do stuff, you know, we, we have Karen Clark who, who likes to, educate us and bring us to things and do stuff with our community members. Nobody else? Yes. Hi, Jolene. I was just wondering, and you might've covered this earlier, I came just a tad late, but how do you track the, the numbers? The, how do you know you've been um, successful one year over the other? You know, we do we we keep track of how many people we register, how many we do do hard copies. We track them. We track our online, and then we check our voter. We track. We now track our voter re checking registrations. Um, I think I think we tell by after we're done talking to our people by how many voted and how they felt about voting. And, and then we have, we also have our data bank that's not fully up and running, but we also could, could possibly do surveys that way. So mm -hmm. we just, we just track how many people we register in that, but we also do do follow-ups with our communities to see if they felt like they voted, if they felt like they did enough. Also, we know where our high concentrations of our populations are. So we we are out there on voting day. We're standing outside mm. and we give away hot chocolate, cookies to everybody. We don't care. And, and that's how we track them too, is by sight. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Janet? Yeah, how, how big is your, what kind of staff do you have? Or, or do you depend, depend mostly on volunteers and how do you get your volunteers? So we, I'm the staff. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do got money now to hire a part-time person. So that'll be nice. But uh, most of them are volunteers and they come from the community. We, we just ask them if they want to help out. Sometimes we got money for a stipend. This year we do. And they just come to us if we're if we're out and about. They'll be like, "You guys need help? Call me. I'll come help." Or what? If, where are you guys going to be? I'll come help you guys. We take a lot of phone calls, and we appreciate volunteers. And we were excited to partner with you guys this year and do a lot of our tabling events with you because we actually launched our new logo this year, and. And dealing with our shirts and the coloring and all of that, it was awesome to have you guys help us do registration, the hard copy registration. We we were doing online ones also because we have two iPads too now. Bill, let them out. I, I have this is Jan again. I have one more. I have one more question about yes. um, when you. And then this is <laughs> um, this is maybe just voter. Uh, in, I don't know minutia. But how do you um, if you're registering people who are homeless and you're just pre-registering them? How do they get? They have to get that um, that card. The card. Where does the card go to? You know, they have to get well, a postcard from the secretary. No, of they State. don't have to get a postcard from them, but most of them have um, a PO box with um, the city of Minneapolis. They have an address in St. Paul they can get mail at too. But no, they don't have to have that card. That doesn't have to be mailed. You can put like they live under the bridge on Twenty Fourth and Cedar. But then when they go, oh, and, oh, okay. Then when they because when they go to vote, then. They're they're already registered, so they don't have yep. to prove it. Oh, yep. oh, super. Okay, thank you. Yep. Come here. Good. This is well, 
Right. Um, <laughs> and then mute, Jolene. <laughs> Um, I'm Alice Mormon, and I've done a number of elections for Little Earth, and and um, I, I just would encourage you to keep on coming to the, the league, and that was from the league, to help you with the voting. You're doing a marvelous job, and we sure can help you, so, and work with you. Thank you, and I appreciate you guys. Yeah. Yeah, Jolene and I were talking about that before it began too, about some other possibilities where the league could partner with her and uh, make voting a tradition. You know, Alice is talking about you guys, so I don't know if you guys know this, but so Little Earth has a residence association and we have actually seven clusters and three apartment buildings and they all have representatives. So we hold elections for that and we make it on the up and up. So the League of Women Voters comes and they take the ballots and they do everything just very professional. And I think that also Alice takes the edge off for the Little Earth community. So they're already used to going in and voting somewhere. Yeah. So then when they go over there and vote, they're like, okay, I've already done this. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was mentioning when you're talking about the homeless, I don't know if they can still do this, but I know um, uh, people, they like, could, could someone say, even though they're homeless, that they're, they're living in like Little Earth or, or someplace and that's where they could be identified and getting their, their ballots. I don't know if it was, if, if, but that was some some way with homeless to have a place, even though it wasn't a corner <laughs> place. But that would be illegal because that would be lying about where they live. So it's and, and maybe and because, it, it, it was not in a place that you lived. It was like a, a, a place that people hung out, a restaurant or something like that. So that it was always, you know, so they could actually get their ballot and, and uh I don't, they used to be able to do that, but maybe they don't, they can't anymore. So I hate, Go ahead, Art. does Art know? <laughs> in, in the past, uh, people who lived at shelters, for instance, the St. Stephen shelters oh, on Clinton, okay. Okay, that uh, they would use that address and they would receive their mail at that address. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and. and and, and they can register to vote in the state of Minnesota as a homeless person where they're residing, like under a bridge, in a tent on this street. They just have to name the two cross streets. But it's interesting, the state of Minnesota will provide them with a PO box, is that what you said? They, uh, if they register as homeless, they can go to like St. Stephen's and the branch and they can actually get mail at them spots, but there's also the city or the state provides, I'm not exactly sure, so I don't want to be quoted. One of them to provide PO boxes for homeless. I'm not sure if it's the city or the state. I'm That's assuming the state because even for Minneapolis residents, it's in St. Paul, so I don't know. But I don't want to. It's wonderful for if they can have an address that makes their life so much easier. Whether it's whether it's for voting or for anything else. Yeah, and for us, one of the things that makes voting easier is tribal IDs. So, so like we're we're trying to work with the tribes because they come down to give IDs out in the urban area, and they do it like twice a year, but we're trying to get them to do it closer to when we're voting in elections. So our people have their tribal IDs on them. So it's easier for them to vote. Right. All right, well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Jolene. Thank, Thank you guys. Get yeah. a lot of men. See you. <laughs> right. Thanks, Thanks so much. Then. And I'll just take a minute and promote next month's program. And that is going to be, we'll have two speakers from um, uh, 
the project People's Climate and Equity Plan, Confronting the Climate Crisis, Creating Jobs, and Reducing Inequality. And um, so look, look for the um, website, it'll be up on that in a day or two, and um, we'll have it in the update as well. So it'll be our climate change topic. Thanks everyone for coming. Well, thank you, Ellen. It was it was marvelous to, to hear her and the connection that you have and all the work she's doing. So thank you very much for what you did to get this together. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was great.